So before the midterm, we are studying this chapter six, uh, lecture six, deadlock. In the deadlock, we started with what is the deadlock? We have seen that deadlock occurs when a process or thread enters a waiting state because a requested system resource is held by another waiting process. So in short, a deadlock occurs when a process is actually waiting for a resource and it's not available. Maybe many other reasons. And that the a special case of deadlock is that a process is waiting for a resource that is held by another process, which is also waiting for a resource that is held by another process. Okay, and it goes on like this. And this actually creates a circular weight. And we have seen that what is this, this we have explained this example that how deadlock occurs. And then we have uh, learned some basic terminologies that what is actually mutual exclusion that only one process at a time can use a resource hold and wait a process holding at least one resource is waiting to acquire additional resource by other process. So it's actually holding one resource It's holding one keyboard. Maybe let's assume your, your computer have two keyboards. So a process is holding one keyboard is waiting for other keyboard. So no one is actually <coughs> getting to use the keyboard. No preemption. A resource can be released only voluntarily. So you cannot take back something that is already given to someone. Okay, then there's a circular weight that I have just told that a process P0 waiting for process P1, P1 is waiting for P2, P2 is waiting for again P0. So actually one person is waiting for another person. It doesn't have to be like P0 waiting for P1. It can be like P0 waiting for P2, P2 waiting for P1, P1 waiting for P0. The number can be different. Okay, but the idea is that person one waiting for person two or three who in return waiting for another person and so on. So this is called a circular weight. One example of circular weight was this one. You see that all the cars are actually stuck in traffic. And I don't know, this is actually a real picture. Why they, why they got this? Okay, uh, can anyone guess the country? I cannot guess actually. So anyway, you can use uh, Bing search for image searching by the way. Uh, so as I was saying that this is actually a circular weight. So as you can see that this traffic jam can only be uh, solved if one of, you can move car in one direction but you cannot actually move car in any direction because all cars are being hold back by another car. So this is how actually it goes on. <coughs> Next one is that uh, the resource allocation graph. So we use uh, this uh, resource allocation graph to actually better understand that whether there is any deadlock or not. So this graph actually it makes things easier for us to understand how this resource allocation graph work. So we first use a circle for each process, a rectangle for resources. And then when a process requests a resource, we use this one. When a process holding a resource, we use this one. So, so basically this is one resource allocation graph. We have explained this one that this one means P1 is requesting R1 resource, but R1 is hold by P2. P2 is requesting R3 resource, but R3 is hold by P3. Same goes for this one. R2 is hold by P1 and P2. And what does this dot mean? This dot mean that how many instance of resources you have or how many people can use the resource at the same amount of time. So one dot means one process can use it. Two dot means two process can use it and so on. So here, as you can see, R4 has three dots. That means three resources, <clears throat> three process can use R4 at the same time. <clears throat> so this is the basic idea of resource allocation graph. Now, what do we do actually with this resource allocation graph? The idea is simple. Using this resource allocation graph, what do we do? We actually try to see whether there is any cycle or not, or in simple terms, whether there is any deadlock or not. Now the term cycle is used because if you can find out any cycle, there is no cycle, you don't have to worry. You can be sure there is no deadlock. Now the question is, what is a cycle? A cycle basically a term that you will learn in your data structure course. I think many of you have already done the data structure course and some of you are doing this semester. So basically cycle means that you see here that P1 is waiting for R1, R1 is waiting for P2, P2 is waiting for uh, connected with R2 and so on. So basically this is a called a cycle. Okay, one is connected to another one. 
Here, this can this can be called another cycle. R two to P two, P two to R three, R three to P three, P three to R four. So, when there is a cycle, there is a possibility that there might be a deadlock. But when there is no cycle, you can be sure that there is no deadlock. So it actually becomes easier for us. If you draw the resource allocation graph and by looking at it, if you see there is no cycle, that means you don't have to worry at all. You can just directly write that, sir, there is only, uh, there is no resources. Uh, there is no deadlock. And if there is a cycle, then you, you have to further uh, investigate, further explore the possibility of deadlock. Now, this was the topics that we have covered before me. We have explained uh, practice these examples. And we have also seen that the question might come in this way that you will be given a graph like this. And you will be asked that from this graph, whether there is any deadlock or not, or in the exam, okay, you will be given a question like this. And from this question, you first have to draw the graph. And from that graph, you have to find out whether there is any deadlock or not. Now, what is the advantage of this? The advantage of this is that you get to draw your own resource allocation graph. That means the resource allocation graph, you can draw your own. Now, why this is an advantage? The advantage is that sometimes, sometimes the person who is actually making the question, he might seems a normal graph, a bit more complicated. Okay, let's just assume I have moved this P2 to here, okay, or P4 to here. I can make it, look it, make it, uh, sorry. I can make it look more complicated than it is. Okay, but if you draw the graph, okay, you can actually make sure that you draw your graph in your own way. This is at the same time is a disadvantage. What is the disadvantage? So if I have given the graph, I might have given the simplest graph. But you, on the other hand, whenever you are trying to draw the graph, you have made a mess out of it and you have made a complicated graph. So this is actually a, a positive and the negative side at the same time. So what you need to do, you just need to practice a little bit so that you actually have an idea that how to draw the graph. One hint is that in many of the cases you will see, they actually draw the graph sequentially. So, so basically P1, P2, P3, P4, all the process are given serial numbers. Okay, so first they draw P1, then P2, then P3, then P4. Okay, so here as you can see first P1, then P2, then P3, P1, P2, P3. So all the process are drawn sequentially. In this way, it actually becomes a little bit easier. Another case, uh, let's assume that we have this uh, question. So from this question, what we, we have to do? First, we can see that P equals to P1, P2, P3, and P4. What does this mean? This means that we have four processes. Process P1, process P2, process P3, and process P4. So we have this four type of process. R equals to R1, R2, R3, same thing. We have these three resources, okay? Then R1 to P1, that means resource one is allocated to P1 and P1 to R2, this means P1 is requesting R2. And then we have this resource R1 have two instance, that means two process can use it at the same time and so on. So by interpreting them one by one, you can draw the resource allocation graph. And one more time, what is the challenge in resource allocation graph? So if you follow the simple rules, it might happen that you might draw an easier graph okay, than it is, or at the same time, you might be actually make a complicated one. So the advice would be that what they do in the book, they actually use a sequential uh, drawing. So if you have four process, they first draw P1, then P2, then P3, then P4. And then in between the processes, they draw the resources. Okay. So here is what we have uh, learned before mid. So after mid, we'll start with the resource allocation graph. So what is a resource allocation graph? First of all, uh, <coughs> deadlock prevention. So we have seen that there are many ways a deadlock can happen. Okay, their characterization are Okay, let me just take one minute. Uh, so there are many reasons the deadlock can happen. So first of all, what we can do to make sure the deadlock don't occur that much, we can first uh, restrain the ways the resources are being allocated or the resources are being requested. So to make sure the deadlock doesn't occur too much, what we do, 
we restrict, we apply some rules that you cannot do this, this, this type of activities. For example, if you think of the road to make sure the traffic jam doesn't occur, okay, there are some set of rules that you need to drive in this way, the rickshaw cannot go to the highways and so on. Even though people in cases violate the rules, but there are a set of rules which actually helps to prevent the traffic jam. So same way, these are the rules that actually helps to prevent the deadlock. So first of all, mutual exclusion. Now, remember that we already have discussed this point, mutual exclusion, hold and wait, no preemption and circular wait. So we will actually study the same topic here, but we'll just change, it, change them a little bit or we will restrict them a little bit. So first one, mutual exclusion, not required for shareable resources, must hold on for non-shareable resources. Okay, to understand this, we need to go back. So let's go back here. What was mutual exclusion? That only one process at a time can use a resource. So if your uh, program is using your keyboard, that means at that time, no other program can use the keyboard. This was the rule for mutual exclusion. But what we did, we changed the rule that no, multiple process can use it at the same time. That means your keyboard, okay, can be shareable, okay between multiple resources. But there is one, one case that if the resource is not shareable, okay, there might be some cases that a resource, the privacy is actually not shareable. For example, if you're using a pen drive, okay, and you are transferring the data, some cases the pen drive might not be non-shareable. Okay, in some cases the pen drive can be used as, as a RAM as well. Okay, some portion of the memory, your computer memory might be restricted. So it depends on what resources you are using. Next one, hold and wait. So what was the previous condition of hold and wait? It was that a process holding at least one resource is waiting to acquire additional resources held by other process. So basically you are, you have some process and you are waiting for other process. Now, these rules say that must guarantee that whenever a process requests a resource, it does not hold any other resources. That means now you cannot do that anymore. If you require a resource, you will request, and if all the resources are available, only then it will allocate your resources. In short, suppose you're trying to uh, uh, use any, a program in your computer that needs mouse, keyboard, and monitor. So if, only if all three are available, you can only use, uh, you, it will only be allocated to you. Previously, what happened, let's assume the mouse and keyboard are busy, but the monitor is available. So they allocated the monitor to, to that program. But now this will not happen. The, what we will do, if all the processes are available, only then, sorry, all the resources are available, only then it will be allocated. Next one is that it, it actually leads to a problem. The problem is low resource utilization. So what happens is sometimes everyone is actually waiting. So one process is everyone is waiting and then no process is actually getting to execute so the efficiency actually falls back by almost i as if i remember the number was 35 percent maybe i have to check back into the book again so as far as i remember the number is 35 percent so you see that normal cases the computer does 100 tasks but if we apply this rule that if you want to execute a program all the resources first need to be available Okay, in that case, that the efficiency falls back by 35%. That means your computer becomes 35% slower. Again, I'm not sure about is it is 35% or maybe some other number, but there's a number that the computer actually becomes slow. Next one is uh, no preemption. So let's see what was the preemption rule in the preempt. Okay, where is it? A resource can be released only voluntarily. So that means if a process somehow got hang of the keyboard, okay, and now it's waiting for mouse and monitor, but the mouse and monitor is already being used by another process and there's only one hour before the process release it. So basically the process is holding keyboard, he needs to wait one hour. So what will he will do for that one hour, he will not use the keyboard and he will not use any other people use the keyboard. So that was the problem in the previous case. But now in this one, if a process is holding some resources, request another resource that cannot be immediately allocated to it, then all resources currently being held are released. So in short, if you are requesting a resource that I need keyboard, mouse 
and sorry, I need mouse and monitor. Okay, I have keyboard, I need the rest of the two. Then if the operating system sees that you, it's not possible for the next one hour or next certain period of time to allocate monitor and keyboard to you, it will not only deny your request, but also it will actually take back the keyboard from you as well. Okay, so this is the first rule of no preemption. Preempted resources are added to the list of resources which our process is being waiting. So basically it will take back the resource and actually add it to the list of resources that are available. So it might happen a process who was actually waiting for keyboard, he will now get the resource. Finally, the process will be restarted only when it can regain its old resources as well as the new ones. So basically we again go back to the hold and wait. So process will only start, the process will only start when all the resources are available. And finally, the, this is the circular wait. To make sure the circular wait doesn't happen, we impose a total watering of all resource types and require that each process request resources in an increasing order of enumeration. So let me explain one by one. First of all, to make sure the circular wait doesn't happen, just like the way we apply uh, traffic lights or signal lights in the roads, same way the operating system also applies some traffic uh, rules for all the process. What is the traffic rules? The rules is that, that each process requests resources in an increasing order of enumeration. So if the process number is P1, he will request first, then if P2, then P3, then P4. Obviously the process number are more than P1, 2, 3. We have seen that in the control panel, you can go and check if each process ID, and you will see the numbers are almost 1,000, 67,000, 5,000 and so on. So this is all about the deadlock prevention. Now, for the next class, um, oh no, sorry. We, for the next class, we'll actually study this algorithm that is called Banker's Algorithm. We have, though we, we have two topics left. So this algorithm actually, this Banker's Algorithm actually helps to actually prevent deadlock, okay? So we will see that how to calculate this deadlock, uh, Banker's Algorithm step by step. But before that, let there is some, uh, yeah, so there are some steps left. So this is all about deadlock prevention. That is the rules that are allocated so that the deadlock cannot happen. But there is another way that deadlock avoidance. So basically we are trying to actually not only prevent deadlock, we are trying to avoid deadlock. So there's actually a gray line here so to understand the difference between these two. So if I ask you the question, what is the difference between avoiding something and preventing something? So you can, uh, you can say that like if I talk about any diseases, okay, if you actually go, don't go to the person infected by the di disease, you, you can call it deadlock avoidance. So you're avoiding it. Or if you actually take medications, okay, a proper precautions all falls onto the prevention. So there is actually a little bit complicacy behind that. And I might ask this question in the Viva as well, that what is the difference between these two to so make sure that you understand it very clearly. So let's go to the discussion, the deadlock avoidance. So first of all, the simplest and the most useful model requires that each process declare the maximum number of resources of each type that it may need. So this is basically very simple. That beginning of the ready state, if you remember that in a chapter four, we have studied that a process goes through different state, new, ready, running, and so on. So the simplest and the most useful model what it does it at the whenever a process in the ready state it has to declare that i need this 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 resources for this 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 amount of time then the deadlock avoidance algorithm dynamically examine the resource allocation state okay and to ensure there can be a no circular weight condition so it actually uh, there is a little bit of algorithm okay very intelligent algorithm that actually automatically calculates what might happen in future okay so unless there is a major changes Okay, so basically the, cal the algorithm can calculate how to best to allocate resources so that the deadlock don't happen or you can avoid this circular weight condition. And finally, the resource allocation state is defined by the number of available and allocated resources. So we'll see that a little bit later, just two slides after this. So what does this mean? So previously we have seen that uh, first we want to prevent deadlock. Now we want to avoid deadlock and then there's a call detect deadlock that is there any possibility that the deadlock can happen 
So let's now for now in my computer, I'm currently running, let's assume a multiple programs. Okay, so I actually want to run an algorithm that will actually check that the way the programs are running, is there any possibility that in future there will be a deadlock or not? So the first step is to allow the system to enter the deadlock state, then the detection algorithms and the recovery scheme. So what does uh, the first one means that we will actually allow our computer that please go to the go and try to uh, create a deadlock. It's like in the traffic road, you will say, please go and create a traffic jam. And you'll see that if whether a traffic jam can be created. So this might seem a little bit uh, awkward or stupid, but it actually works because at the earlier stage, okay, if this type of uh, events occur, the operating system can actually identify that, okay, so this, this and this, these two person or these two process are actually problematic. So let's take care of these two processes first and so on. Then we have this detection algorithm that you will see very soon. And then we have the recovery scheme that how if a deadlock occurs, how to recover. So the banker's algorithm, the banker's algorithm actually helps us with this. So let's assume that we have uh, multiple instances. Each process must prior claim maximum use that how much uh, resources that you need. I need two keyboards, I need uh, three mouse or three hour of mouse, I need monitor and so on. When a process requests a resource, it may have to wait. When a process gets all the resources, it must return them in the finite amount of time. So basically here there's a concept that if a process gets all the resources, okay, what it has to do, it has to return them after a certain amount of time. Now, here is actually the basic diagram of it. So let me just explain how this diagram works. So first of all, what does this P0, P1, P2, P3, P4 means? These are the processes. So in your system, there is a process P0, P1, P2, P3. And what does R0, R1, R2, R3 means? So these are the resources that you have in your system. So you have a computer where these five processes are running and these four resources are being used. Now, P0 and P1, P2, for each, there are some values here, as you can see. So what does these values mean? So P0 2, that means P0 is using two resources of R0. P0 is using zero instances of R1. P0 is using one instant of R2. P0 is using two instead of R3. Same if I go for P4, let's assume P4 is Zoom. So Zoom app is using one instance of R0, zero instance of R0, R1, two instance of R3, and zero instance of R, sorry, R2 and R3. So basically these are the resource names and of these resources, how many instance are being used by which process is being given in this matrix. This matrix is called allocation matrix, okay? And here at the beginning of the question, you can see that each process has a maximum instances. So R0 has eight, R1 has five, R2 has nine, and R3 has eight. So all these resources can be used by uh, eight instances, five and so on. Now, uh, there is a part and now this is the, so instances means that how many process can use a resource at the same amount of time. And then we have this max. What does max means? Max means that P0, okay, to execute its task, how much, what is the, maximum amount of resources it needs. So basically it's saying that P0, if you give P0, let's give, give P0 a name. Let's assume the name of the P0 is A. So A, if you give A, three R0, two R1, one R2, and four R3, A can be, A can finish its work. So P1, let's say it's the name Zoom. So if you give Zoom app, it doesn't need any R0, it needs two R1, it needs five R2, it needs three R3. So if you allocate this amount of resources to Zoom app, it can finish its task. But as you can see, this is the maximum allocation that you need. And as you can see, currently P1, okay, it has only one R1, but it needs, let me draw here. It has only one R1, but it needs two R1. That means it's short of one. It needs two R2, it needs, uh, it has two R2, but it needs five. So I can say this is actually how much is the maximum need. The name should actually give a maximum need matrix. 
So currently it has only two, but it needs five. So it is short of three. It needs three, it only have one. So it actually short of two. So that's how actually we, uh, we have these two matrices. Now, uh, let me restart the meeting.